My name is Jamie Duma. I head up the multi-platform distribution team at uh, CBS on the operations and engineering side of the house. Um, I felt that uh, Lucy Meets Lambda was a real fitting title for uh, describing our migration right now of our workloads into AWS. As a little background, uh, I started with CBS uh, about 10 months ago, focusing on unifying three different uh, business operations into one group, focusing on, on optimizing those operations as well as uh, trying to assist with the strategic vision and migration of our media workloads into AWS. Our business, and I'm gonna say our business well, because I have some of my teammates in the back, so I don't have to say my. Our business is purely B2B. So when we look about that, I'm not B2C at all, although I do have some other peer friends who are there who are more in that space. So my team takes in content, they process it, they'll QC it, they'll regionalize it when necessary, and then they'll distribute the content for domestic and international consumption. So that is our huge load, is domestic and international. If you don't know about CBS, I do have to do our, our you know, the normal plug. Uh, so we are a mass, mass media co company that creates and distributes premium content to a variety of platforms to audiences around the world. We have origins that date back to the dawn of broadcasting age. We're not the first, but we're like uh, second or third. Um, and uh, we've done pretty well for ourselves in that space. The CBS network itself has been number one in television for 14 out of the last 15 years. Um, we take a look at our sisters and brothers at CBS All Access and Showtime Anytime. Those business units have been key drivers of growth um, in our industry as we have shifted a lot more from network television to app-based viewing. Um, to give another shout out for our CBS Sports Digital team as well, uh, if you look at the fact that we've done from a uh, successful Super Bowl coverage where we broke all the records that we've had from uh, app-based viewing of the content. And because of our history, again, back to the Lucy meets Lambda, we have a vast library of entertainment content that does allow us to span across almost every sector of m and &E, including publishing. So today I'm going to talk about a, a few different things, but the main thing uh, I wanted to focus on was as we talk about our migrating our workloads uh, into the cloud, um, we're going to talk about what was our drivers for doing it, right? What was our challenges? And we're not done yet. We are launched. We're not done yet. So our challenges. Um, and then what are those next things to the fact that we're working on moving forward? Um, unlike uh, some of my brothers and sisters over on the digital interactive side of it, uh, we are fresh from the operations and engineering because we're more in the traditional space. So this was definitely a, a very new experience for us as we moved to the cloud. Um, so why, all right? So that's always the, the question to it. All right, so first off, one of the reasons if we look to the first, to the first aspect is death by duplication, right? Um, when we talk about singularity, um, it's great to talk about physics when we're talking about the Big Bang Theory, but when we're talking about actual workflows, this is a bad thing, especially as the more that you touch content, the more you affect the video quality of it. And again, we want to make sure our content is of a premium experience. Plus, not to the fact it's also time consuming, waste of resources, right? When you look at costs, cost optimizations, and those type of things. To give you an idea, some stats uh, with my team from January to May. We ingested on-prem uh, about uh, 79,000 files, um, unique files. And we also, on the distribution side of it, we've, we processed and distributed close to 319,000 files. Now, the outbound part of it was definitely, uh, you know, definitely non-repeatables. They were distinct for the regions they were going to, but on the ingest side, we definitely had duplication to it. Second undifferentiated heavy lifting. We weren't making that decision. Um, the commoditized prep work that it takes for us to do our work takes too much time. And that's one of those things that we definitely want to abstract out. Because we want to be able to do is concentrate on our ninja skills and not the setup. We want to remove the barriers between the idea through implementation. And finally, Viewership is eroding. Um, I'm just as guilty of it because I do my binge watching on probably every other app device but what's on the set-top box, uh, except for Dis Deadliest Catch. For some reason, Discovery just not allowed to put it anywhere else but on my Verizon cable box. So you got me there. 
But overall, at the time, it's not that TV is diminishing. It's just the fact that channel surfing is evolving into app surfing and app surfing. And we want to keep ahead of that, and we want to be able to move faster. So, where are we at right now? We're in the cloud. We launch. We're about three weeks actually in production. We had it actually ready a little bit sooner, um, but no one was using it. But now we're actually using it, so we kind of is a you know great success, both for ingest through into delivery. We were uh, took us about one year from planning to implementation. Now you might say for the fact that well that doesn't sound very agile. Well, I would say for the fact that it's true, but there was a lot of ripping back to the studs. Um, we wanted to make sure. Uh, as we started down the process, that we weren't building upon legacy. We wanted to come back to the foundation and build that back up again. So when we talk about, we did have an initial plan when we started, right? So even before we realized that we had a rip back, we didn't have a plan. Not earth shattering, right? Very simple. We're not reinventing the wheel here. There's a lot of folks are doing this space and doing it very well. So we want to have it where post houses themselves upload the content into um, our supply chain. We want to process it in some form or fashion. Uh, we want to apply some human and some machine content analysis and a validation to it. And then we want to send it out. The real challenge that we had experienced along our journey had uh, nothing to do about technology itself. Um, but uh, we, we did realize the fact that Actually, let me step back. We realized the fact that, uh, or at least I did, my staff might just, uh, just believe everything I say, is that I don't necessarily know that I know everything that has to go into a current media supply chain in the cloud, as well as the future for our own business needs. So this is the things that we are learning about on the fly. Um, and there is a lot of things missing here, but this is where we're going to build into it. So, so we had our idea, but we needed more help. So we called in our friends at SDVI um, to say, hey, you guys are ninjas in this space, and so we need help. Um, to give the uh, plug, but it's a well-earned plug, uh, SDVI can't say enough great things about the people um, as well as the solutions they provide. So SDVI Rally, that's uh, one of the primary solutions that we're using is a cloud-based platform. Uh, that deploys, it manages, and it optimizes media supply chains. So it's great. We create it, it and, and uh, Rally deploys it, and then Rally manages it. Rally spins up and down uh, infrastructures uh, in minutes. They can provide accurate cost tracking and reports, which is something that we can't do today, so we're looking forward to taking the benefit of this. Um, they also provide infrastructure analytics and modeling. Coming from a traditional play out and media operations environment, um, I personally found Rally to be absolutely amazing. Um, within minutes, we can change out our transcoding solutions, our QC solutions, our, you know, our uh, file transfer solutions. Um, on detection of different codecs, we can um, on the fly automatically have these files go through different adventure paths on the processing and also call different AIs based off of what the content is. Um, and we can still change all that in minutes. And what's amazing is be able to change it in minutes in an environment where I am so bursty. So from a traditional on-prem scenario, you got to plan for the absolute worst. And I don't have to do that now, which is fantastic. And then finally, uh, SDVI is actually a sprint-based company. A lot of companies will say that. They actually are. Every couple of weeks, we get a new feature. And as a girl, I always love new features. So by the way, there uh, definitely isn't a cocktail napkin big enough for this one. Um, so we went to my office wall. So SDVI was very nice to come on in. We spent a couple of days to draw it out. Um, so by the way, this is my media supply chain. I think she's very pretty. Um, and uh, you know, we worked it out. And uh, SCVI listened, and um, we were able to just collaborate. Where were we at? Where we wanted to go? And help provide some best practices along the way. OK, so let's dig into the challenges, right? OK, number one, overall media mission. Yeah, we didn't have that. We had a plan. We had results we wanted to achieve, right? We want to deduplicate. We want to cost optimize. We need to have agility. We want to have speed to market. But those are outcomes. They aren't an actual mission. So that's what we needed to have. Um, metadata strategy. 
<laughs> yeah, we didn't have that either. Uh, a metadata strategy is 100% required for any type of scale and automation. Uh, so if you're looking to go forward with any of this, this is one exercise I highly recommend that takes a lot of time, but it's like that upfront work. Everything is able to build off of it. I always say this as well. It's absolutely required. It's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but you have to have it and you have to govern it as, a, as you move forward. And then finally, strategic list metadata. We have plenty of that. Um, we have a lot of metadata that's either replicated, replicated in full, replicated in not so full. Um, and what I, one of the things that I have found for the fact when it comes to strategic list metadata is that sometimes it could be more of a blocker than it could be a help. It ends up being a lot of noise. So we had a lot of things to sift through. So we went back, we thought about it, um, I perused on it, I pulled, put on my old product uh, manager hat as well, and said, what do we want to be when we grow up? And so we've created our overall media mission. Right? So what we want to do is just like AWS and SDVI is uh, performing the undifferentiated heavy lifting so that we can get on with it, we want to do it for our own CBS uh, teams, right? We have a lot of folks who are also processing content just so that they can do the things on their, on their product and platforms in order to get it out to market for monetization. So what we want to do instead is provide a come and get it model. So allow us to receive the production assets. We'll capture and associate both the, the technical information as well as the universally interesting content-based metadata against that high, highest quality asset. And we're gonna try and automate this as much as possible. Uh, we'll transfer and manage the uh, assets and the meta metadata in what we're calling our universal content lake. And then finally, again, we have a coming request it model. When you send us an uh, API, you can hear a call for the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the golden master it is that you wanna have, or ask us to the fact to transform it in some way, again, so they can just get on with the work. So we feel good about that. We have that mission. Next, metadata strategy. What goes into a content lake? How do you manage it? So again, there was a lot of things that kind of unwind here of what we wanted to do. So uh, one thing I like to do is give also a shout out to Perspective Media Group. Um, they did a lot of work for us. They helped us out. They came in, um, worked with myself and the staff for weeks. It was a long time. Uh, they came in and spent the time to sit down and discuss, you know, what was our history? Where did we came from? Where we wanted to get to? One of the most important things they also helped with us is that help us develop a vernacular so that even internally we could talk about the same things and know what we were talking about to each other. And that was absolutely critical. Um, we needed a strategy. We listened. Um, and we, we literally took everything to heart. Um, and uh, I would say for the fact when it comes to metadata, we're kind of really proud of ourselves. So I'm going to get into that here in a second. So this was the initial plan that we actually had, and then with the help of Perspective Media Group, they helped us realize that we were one block short of something that was really critical with the chain of it. Um, when executing content and machine learning validation, we have to manage the metadata in a universal form. Um, especially for the rest of CBS to benefit it. Because else, again, we run through, we create a lot of new information based off of machine learning tool sets. And what do we have? We have more strategic list metadata that's more noise than useful. So I also want to uh, rant because I'm on stage and I get to do it. Um, when it comes to metadata strategy, r right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm very passionate about this one point, is that I'm not talking about an asset management system. Asset management system is a tool. It's not a metadata strategy. So make sure for the fact that you create that metadata strategy that works for your business and for, and for um, your assets itself. Then decide if, number one, you need an asset management system, and number two, for the fact, if it's the right tool for the job. All right, so here we go. Let's talk about some data modeling. Everyone loves this. Okay, so. With the help of PMG, Perspective Media Group, this is what we uh, actually uh, came up with. Again, the common vernacular, a strategy for linking information together. So we have a scenarios where we'll talk about the element types, where we take have the aspect of incoming files, and we put them in a grouping, right? So your wave file, you're over there with the audio. 
your video with Muxed Audio, you're over there as a program master. And so what we did is kind of group these together into uh, element types. Then what we do is start linking up the chain, right? So we have found for the fact of most of our element types actually kind of group to the episode level. Um, they're all topical things that assist with it. So it's all the audio files and ME files and key art and uh, textless materials, things that we need for international distribution. So that becomes our program master package um, that's linked to the, epi to the episode level. And one thing you also notice is the fact that we're creating UIDs on this along the way. Primarily for the fact of if we wanted to actually complete our media mission of being more of a kind of a media operations that can handle uh, the bulk of the load for majority of our, of our CBS brothers and sisters, we need to make sure for the fact that everything was unique. Um, and we didn't have that before. Uh, finally, one of the things to take a look at, you'll see how we link to the season and then to the series. And then you can have other things that's linked to it as well as key art for that season, uh, you know, generic promos for those series. The UID, I just say for the fact that we did research on that, and again, we wanted to make sure that we tried to minimize any mistakes along the way. So we really feel good about our, our UID uh, solution itself, okay? We are using, I'll use the fancy terms, of RFC 4122 type version 4. Basically what this is, is that it is a 128-bit um, UID. Um, that we are using a uh, Java UID4 library. And I'd also like now to give a shout out to Java for making it really easy for us to have a UID generator because they actually have the libraries built in. But what they use is something called Secure Random. And what that is is a cryptographically strong random number generator. And that's used as the C to generate uh, all random numbers off of that. So chances of collisions or repeats of UIDs, it's one in a billion. So we feel pretty good about that. If, uh, if you end up have a collision in less than a billion UIDs that you've generated, um, 10 to 1, it's a software bug. Um, either way, you have two options. If you have a collision, either check your code or buy a lottery ticket. So next, we had to uh, get the market quick because we're doing a lot of different things in a very close timeline. So what we did within our department is that we built an interim UID registry system. We did it all on AWS native services, and we did it in about three weeks. So it was two weeks of development, about a week of hardening. Since then, we've done some additional changes to it and updates and such, but for the most part, that was the bulk of the, uh, with the effort with it, which was fantastic. Um, just kind of stepping it through, what see is API Gateway. API Gateway was great, so it allowed us to first have a manual interface that was developed so that my staff could actually create UIDs and put other universally interesting metadata associated that we needed from a higher level to it. And then now as well, we've actually automated upstream business, uh, business systems to actually call API Gateway on behalf of the, of the user itself. So we're getting to the point now that we are this, my staff is actually using it as a reference um, than it is to actually create the actual UIDs themselves. Uh, we then go to, uh, you know, all this stuff goes to DynamoDB. DynamoDB was great because um, when we started, so DynamoDB, if you don't know, I'm sure both of you do know, but it's a NoSQL database. One thing great about that is, again, when we started on this process, we didn't know everything that we needed to capture. So to be stuck in a, a prescribed schema was not going to work. Um, since we started with the UID registry, I think we've already added four uh, fields that were actually required with it. So one thing nice about Dynamo, it doesn't care. It just allows you to add or delete that um, on the fly. So that was quite um, beneficial for us. And finally, Lambda. I am a big believer that everyone needs a little Lambda in their life. It's one of my favorite AWS uh, Nava services. So we have it for the fact of a Lambda for add of UIDs, for deletion, and for updates, um, each being decoupled only to do their own thing. With the add Lambda, that's where we put additional checks in it, again, to make sure we don't have collisions of UIDs, so it kind of takes care of that. And then finally, we're using SQS. Uh, SQS is great. Um, we are purposely, because it's a de decoupled, you know, de decoupled architecture, um, we're using a FIFO queue because when you're doing anything, especially with UIDs, 
when you have ads and deletes and updates, they have to be processed in an orderly fashion. So SQS is a great tool for that. This is just a little snippet just to show you that actually prove I'm actually am using DynamoDB. Um, so what you'll see here for the fact, this is what we have our element table. So let's talk about that, uh, that program master I ma mentioned with video and muxed audio. So you have the UID itself and file name, file type, element type, and most importantly, the parent UID. So what we do with the, um, on the aspect with the parent UID, that allows us to step up in the tables at DynamoDB to the episode, to the season, and to the series. And then what you get out of that is something that we're calling our asset shell. Uh, the asset shell itself, or what you'll see for the fact, again, you'll see the UID, uh, you'll see the program master pull out the episode number. You'll see the season UID, series UID. So we step that all up to create one shell. And then what we do for the fact with that one shell itself is that we will send that to SDVI. SDVI is constantly con listening to that queue and it's consuming any of the messages that we put in there um, like to add into the environment, to update, or to delete from that environment. And then what they do is they actually transform the message in probably something more of an operational fashion view. They make it more pretty. So, um, and from this, now we have a landing zone, if you will, within SDVI Rally so that we can actually start putting in files into it and allowing it so we can do orchestration of the media supply chain with processing. We are using SDVI for two different solutions. Um, we have Rally itself for the supply chain, so it's doing all the orchestration and processing for it. But we're also using uh, SDVI for our front end. So if you notice when I said we want our post houses to upload to a portal, they're actually providing that portal for us, um, which was great because we were able to get into the market faster. The other thing I'll just point out here, um, is this uh, one of the benefits, again, with the DynamoDB is as we continued on the path of developing and, and coming on a path with, with getting into SCVI and setting up our workflows, uh, we realized the fact that um, we wanted a portal for each dub house, right? But I don't want 350 portals. Who can manage that? So here's the power of tags. Love tags. Um, what we're able to do is actually provide these tags uh, as a part of our registry information. And then what we do is we use that as a whitelisting, if you will, for the for the portals itself. So when, uh, say, for example, you have Jamie Posthouse who logs in, Jamie Posthouse logs in and only sees those assets that Jamie's post house is supposed to upload. I don't see anything else in the environment. Uh, so that was a, um, a fantastic solution that actually, I won't say that we actually created, I bet you it was STVI that gave us that recommendation. So since this is like the business executive track, I felt necessary required like give you some numbers. Um, so our UID registry and dev costs, $3.42. I don't think I've expensed that yet either. So um, you're leveraging Cloud9, again, API Gateway, Dynamo, Lambda, and SQS. If there's any developers out there, if you've ever uh, had a chance to see uh, to uh, see and play around with Cloud9, I highly recommend you do it. It's really fantastic. It's a cloud-based IDE that allows you to write, test, and debug your code. One of the nice things about it is that it allows you to run your Lambdas locally so you can actually test it and also when it's good you can push it out to your lambda right there in that one uh, in that one GUI so that is fantastic. UAA, UAT registry costs are about 75 cents a month and then finally uh, in production our registry costs I'm feeling very optimistic based off it currently so here's the benefit on the aspect of pay as you go. So since this is the business track area, I feel for the fact that I need to give a PSA out to all my peers. Look, as a leader, we all get to, you know, have tight timelines. If you feel the requirement that you have to fill the gap for the department for a while, and you decide during Christmas to New Year's to build your own UID registry, yeah, be prepared for the fact that your staff might troll LinkedIn and make you into the largest laptop sticker that has ever been created. Also what happens is that you have to put it on your laptop. 
You can see it back a couple tables. I'd love to show it in real life. Bonus to it is TSA. I can't lose my computer even if I tried. Bad problem is my face is on my computer. So strategic list metadata everywhere. This is a really hard but yet interesting uh, problem statement. Um, we had for the fact of all these different systems and it really kind of looked a lot like this where we had different systems communicating to different locations, even geographically, and we weren't able to access this information across these different silos. And, you know, to give, give kudos to the fact, it's not like we set out to create silos, right? I mean, typically what happens when the company starts, everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And then a special project needs to start up, and you send a little team, and you take over a team of ninjas over to to figure out a project, and uh, yep, I can vocalize, don't you worry about it. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, and then what happens is that they become the masters of it and they end up owning it, right? So now you have a silo, and then that happens again. And then you acquire a few more services or a few more businesses, and now you have all these different silos. So what we are trying to do now is at least start the aspect of eliminating as much as we can. So. What we have put in is a, a translation layer um, so we can do some short-term data harvesting. Um, one of the first steps that we're doing is eliminating all non-API things, emails, spreadsheets, shared folders, uh, drop boxes, jump boxes, anything in association with that. Um, and then we are, as much as possible, leveraging the translation layer, thank you, the translation layer itself, uh, so that we can get away from heavy integrations. I will say for the fact that one of the things that I am very adamant about is that if something has been keyed in once by a human in a company, it should never be keyed in again. So that's really something that we're really focusing on. I figured out a fact, I kind of stepped you through what we're actually doing um, it's interesting how it formats differently, huh? Uh, what we're actually doing. Um, we are going to be launching our first 24 by 7 cloud-based playout channel in September. And so uh, what we're doing with the supply chain right now is the ingest for that channel and then also the delivery with it, so that come and get, come and get model. So what we're first doing is through the translation layer, we are actually taking a feed because we do need a push in that regard from a rights management system that's giving us product information as well as season and series level information. And it's coming to our UID registry. We're taking that, we're providing UIDs and we are sending it back to the rights management system. Next up what happens is then from our work order system, our PO system, we're getting orders and from there we're getting episode information and we are also getting all the files that are going to be delivered in association to what we're wrapping up in what I showed earlier called our asset shell. And we're providing and publishing that information into SDVI. And then as well as when we are done processing the content itself in the supply chain, we have an archive management system that we are feeding into as an FYI with that. And then one of the last steps is the new traffic system. We are also giving the new traffic system an update to the fact of, hey, this content's here, here's all the information about it, it's this many segments, it's this duration, and whenever you are ready to schedule it, you can just come and call on us. So when they do schedule it, we get that dub list or that schedule back to us, and then we will call SDVI, um, get the information back about that asset shell, and then we will register the content with the um, playout system that we are, the automation and playout system that we'll be using in the cloud. Um, and then one of the final things is that SDVI will do after registration, we'll move that content from our content lake to the S3 location that this automation playout solution will be using. And if the if this stuff is in an archive, so if it's in Glacier, SVI will take care of that restoration and that uh, final copy over to the S3 location. So, where we finally got to, uh, returning back to the overall mission, we wanted to be, again, a media operations that could suffice for um, all, the, all of our entities within CBS. So, content is delivered. We have it going through quarantine, and I love this aspect to it, right? It could hit on antivirus. 
If it fails because as a virus, my staff doesn't have to do anything. Because what's going to happen is it's going to be a notification back to the post house saying thanks, but no thanks. We don't even have to touch it. Then we would go for the fact of we probe it, and based off the rules of what we put in as a global tech spec, if it doesn't suffice, again, my staff, do, my staff doesn't even know it's, this file has even arrived. We'll kick it back and say thanks, but this is not matching up to what we want. And then we go through the fact of auto QC and proxy generation, uh, which we're using, uh, we just changed over to using AWS Media Convert for. Auto QC, again, if it fails, we can just kick it back, again, without even having my staff waste their time on looking at the content. Now, I will be openly honest, is that right now, since we're trying to learn how to be bigger, better, and faster, we are uh, not kicking back on the auto QC. We are taking it in, and we are taking a look at all the errors and making sure they're actually real errors, um, and we are in the process of kind of sweetening the auto uh, QC process of it. But we will, at this point, also do content analysis uh, and machine learning. So we will be stepping into that really soon, probably in the next quarter. Um, so the folks who are validating the technical QC aspect will also be validating and being basically our ground truth for what the feedback we're getting from machine learning. And then finally, all that content itself is going into what we're to the universal content link and what we're calling the program master package. And then again, over time, everything that's lightweight will keep an S3. Everything that's heavy will naturally, from a life cycle standpoint, just kind of drip into Glacier. So we're moving. We're excited. You know, I'll give you a shout out. Uh, definitely um, not because my team's here, because I already had it in my presentation, but it was a big confidence boost for the team. The team's done a great job. We've worked a lot of long hours. We have more hours to work, but we're not letting them know that. Um, and it's great, and I think the fact that we look at it, or at least when I look at it, I think we look a little bit like this, but realistically, it's probably a lot more like this, but we're gonna get better at it, and we're looking forward to getting better at it. So what's coming up? Uh, more translations, you saw that translation layer. We slowly have to do other upstream business and also downstream business integrations. Um, again, trying to get and moving away from those monolithic type heavy integrations into something more uh, you know, uh, rest based. More optimization. We still have a lot of system hardening and a lot of sweetening to do. Um, we also, over time, will see how we can actually do more cost optimizations. And the cost optimizations, not only from the platform or the infrastructures itself, um, but also just how we're doing business. So that'll be another way to cut with the to tie into cost optimization. Archive strategy and potential migration. Uh, we've actually already have architected it. We're, we're gonna go, we're, we're going in that direction. Um, done the cost analysis and it just makes sense. So that's another side project. More automation for P B2B deliveries. Um, as you see, we've only done right now our integration so that we can get this content to another B, which is gonna be play out. But what we wanna start doing, whoops, is uh, to uh, be able to if a work order comes in, it just happens, right? So that's one of the last things. Oh, no, one of the last things is artificial intelligence. So things that we have lined up, a project that I call uh, Legal for Less. So trying to have the ability to automate our standards and compliance, where actually we can actually just harvest out those things that could be questionable, provided into a timeline, and then standards and compliances can look at it as a one-off as opposed to entire 100% screenings. And then we're also finally going to be applying a lot of this for international workflows, a lot for comparisons, uh, especially with uh, text to the textless comparisons, but also for those things that could have sensitivities uh, for other regions that be able to grab that information and, and be able to um, uh, strategically store it for access in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much. Are we doing questions? Oh, no, okay, after. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, thanks. Oh, no, no questions anymore. Have a good one.